Hi everyone and welcome back to another one of our editions of our virtual backyard field trips. Uh, my name is Trevor, if, you have, if this is your first time tuning in today, and we're really excited to have you all join us as we talk this week about invertebrates and pollinators. Uh, now, just a quick thank you to everyone that has supported the alligator farm uh, through this very difficult time. Uh, we're really happy to say that our animal adoptions and our GoFundMe page are doing very well in helping us do our job to make sure that our ambassador animals in our collection is well taken care of. So thank you again for everyone participating. And if you haven't found something for your kids to do this summer, we are in fact having our zoo camp. We're making sure that we follow very strict guidelines followed or outlined by the CDC to ensure everyone's safety. If you wanna learn more about what we're doing to make sure we keep your campers safe, you can log on to our social media pages or our uh, website to figure out exactly what we are all doing. Now let's talk about invertebrates. Invertebrates uh, claim a huge part of our animal kingdom. Uh, this taxa actually has over 125 million described species within it alone. That makes up about 97% of our animal kingdom. So most of the animals that we have out in our world are invertebrates. Now, if you don't know what an invertebrate is, we can easily define that uh, for you right now. An invertebrate is anything without a backbone or spine. So myself, you, our lemurs, our vultures, our crocodilia, they all have backbones and spines, which means they are vertebrates. Anything without that are our pollinators, our uh, bugs, our insects, sometimes our animals that live in the ocean like octopus or crayfish or lobsters, right? These all make up those invertebrates. Now you might be asking yourself, all right, if they don't have a backbone or spine, how exactly do they keep their form, keep their shape? Well, they have different types of skeletons. We humans, and anything with a vertebrate, has an endoskeleton, which simply means our skeleton is on the inside of our body. Now, if you are an invertebrate, right, if you are a bug, you're an insect, you're something that's flying in the wind like a butterfly, you're gonna have something called an exoskeleton. And we have a lot of really cool examples of exoskeletons to show you all here today. Now, there is still one third type of skeleton out there, and this is a very little known skeleton. Uh, this is something called a hydrostatic skeleton. This is a skeleton that is mostly comprised of, of water. So if you think of jellyfish, if you think of octopus, right, things that live in the ocean or large waterways, right, that necessarily don't have form or shape when they leave the water, right, that is what we call a hydrostatic skeleton. Now, if you're an invertebrate, you're more than likely going to have that exoskeleton, but we also see a lot of invertebrates, again, that live in the ocean, that have that water-comprised skeleton, or the hydrostatic skeleton. Now, I do want to show you guys some quick examples of these skeletons or molts. So if you guys want to come right over here, we'll actually start with this monarch butterfly. So this was a butterfly that was actually found here on alligator farm property. It more than likely lived out its life cycle, right? And ultimately perished. And so we were able to preserve it here and show you exactly what the skeleton is comprised of, all right? Now, the wings itself, right? And that inside body system, right? That is all, right, part of the exoskeleton. So even after this animal dies, right, that exoskeleton is still going to stick around. Other examples of exoskeletons are molts from spiders or tarantulas. So this is a molt from one of our Mexican red knee tarantulas, right? And you can see it's hollow on the inside. And that's simply because when these animals shed or go through their molt or get rid of that extra exoskeleton, which is a lot, enables them to grow, they still keep all their innards. They still keep everything inside of them. They simply just shed the outside part. Again, that exoskeleton. Now, invertebrates come in a lot of different shapes and forms, right? Some are butterflies, some are spiders. Others can be scorpions, right? And these are all, again, exoskeletons, molts, of different animals that we've had here at the park that simply just shed them to allow them to keep growing and getting bigger and bigger. Now, while looking at molts and exoskeletons is a lot of fun, I do wanna show you one of our ambassador animals. This is an ambassador tarantula, so I'm gonna go ahead and open up his little enclosure and bring him on out. 
So this is a gold knee tarantula, right? And this species is native to most of Central and South America. Now, tarantulas or invertebrates, animals with those exoskeletons, right, have that that covers their entire outside body. That is their form of their protection. That keeps them, right, nice and safe. It also gives their body form and shape. Now, as our tarantula gets bigger, I showed you some molts earlier, right, he's actually going to shed all of that outside exoskeleton, right, to allow him to grow and get even bigger than what he is now. So this animal is at the very beginning stages of his life cycle, right, and hopefully here in a few years, we'll have a much larger golden tarantula to show you all. Now, what you're seeing right now is our Cuban, Cuban purple bird eater is a type of arachnid or tarantula, just like our little goldeny we saw earlier. Now, a lot of you might be wondering, what is the difference between, say, a spider and an insect? Well, one of the biggest differences, and the one that you can instantly see right off the bat, is the amount of legs. Spiders, or hexapods, are only going to have six legs, right? While our arachnids have, and you probably guessed it, eight. So, if you're looking at one of these creepy crawlies and you're wondering, is it a spider, is it an insect, right? All you have to do is count the amount of legs, right? And if you come up to eight, then it is an arachnid or a spider or even a scorpion. If it's six, it's gonna be one of those insects. Yeah. Let's see if we can encourage him off my hand. Now, while invertebrates are extremely fascinating, I do want to focus in on pollinators, simply because these are the animals that are critically important to not only our ecosystems and our biodiversity, but to even our own health and safety as well. Pollinators provide us a huge ecosystem service. They basically allow for plants to continue to grow and reproduce. As pollinators go from one flower to another, they actually aid in that plant's reproduction so that plant can keep passing along its own genetic material. Now, we are gonna meet up with some uh, really fascinating guests that are gonna give us a little inside view of how pollination works. So I am gonna actually uh, meet with my friend Judy here over at Southern Horticulture, and she's gonna talk to us about some of the different pollinators and plants we can plant in our own garden to help these animals. We'll see you guys here shortly. Hey everyone, so we're here at Southern Horticulture to learn all about the plants we can put in our pollinator-friendly gardens. So let's go ahead and get inside. A look at some of the plants that we have right over here. Uh, so if you are looking for something for to attract honeybees, uh, they definitely prefer yellow, white, blue, or purple flowers. They can't really see red, uh, so flowers like daisies are more preferable to these animals. Native bees like native trees and shrubs and fruiting trees as well. So if, if you have any of those in your backyard, that's gonna be making for an excellent addition to your pollinator garden. Now, to add a little extra to your pollinator garden, you might even wanna consider shallow mud puddles as they provide butterflies and bees with the necessary water and nutrients they need for uh, their life cycles. And of course, one of the most famous types of pollinating plants is the milkweed. This uh, flower, or excuse me, this plant is gonna attract a lot of your monarch butterflies. Uh, it has been known as, known as almost a home plant for monarch butterflies. And we actually have one joining us right over here, right above me. Now, not all pollinators uh, do the same job equally. Uh, honeybees will actually do a much better job at pollinating those flowers than other butterflies. So again, if you are trying to attract those honeybees, you're going to want, want your whites, your yellows, your purples, and your blues in your garden. If you want to attract monarch butterflies, milkweed is the way to go. So a lot of you might be wondering exactly how does pollination work? Well, the bee will actually climb into or onto the flower, the male flower, and the pollen will stick onto the hairs of the bee's body. Now, once the bee crawls into the female flower, right, the second flower that it will visit, that pollen is brushed onto the pistil of the flower, right, and the pollen fertilizes the ovaries of the base of the flower, and the ovaries will then develop the fruit. So here on our citrus tree here, these little flowers, after they have pollinated, will then begin to develop that fruit. 
So a big thank you to Southern Horticulture and Judy for le letting us stop by today and take a look at all of their different plants. If you're looking to start your own pollinator garden, here is definitely a great place to go ahead and get started. Now we're gonna go ahead and head back to the alligator farm as we have another special guest waiting for us. Now I'm sure all of you are wondering, how do I go about building my own pollinator garden? Well, there's a ton of resources. Not only the alligator farm uh, can provide to you, but a lot of different facilities all across the country. As most of you know, it was Earth Day a few days ago. So this is a great time to get outside in your own backyard and start putting a little bit back into our planet. Now, pollinator gardens can be a fantastic way for you and your family to not only bond together and stay healthy in these different difficult times, but also a great way to promote, again, our healthy environment and ecosystems. As you can see behind me, I am surrounded by different pollinators and our own little pollinator garden here at the alligator farm. I even have one of our caterpillars here, right, which will hopefully soon make its own chrysalis, right, and emerge as a butterfly in the near future. And as you can see here, we are in our little pollinator garden here at the alligator farm, and we have a very, very rare sighting. We have one of our butterflies actually emerging from its chrysalis. Now, butterflies will take about two to five weeks, depending on the species, to go from its caterpillar uh, stage to the butterfly stage. So, this animal has probably been incubating in there for no less than two weeks, 14 days, uh, ready to make this immersion. Again, you might be asking yourself, what exactly can I plant in my backyard that is safe? And there is a lot of things that are safe, not only for you and your family, but also safe for our pollinators as well. You can go to our website or you can go into our social media pages and look, in, and look for the Garden for Wildlife uh, PDF, right? And this is gonna tell you exactly what you need to basically start your own pollinator garden at home. It's very, very simple again. Sometimes you only need a few pots or sometimes you just need a little bit of land, right? To plant these, um, plant your pollinator uh, friendly species. And sooner, um, you'll, or very soon, you'll have a lot of bees and butterflies and hopefully a lot of pollinators joining you in your own backyard. Now there's a lot of projects you can participate in other than just planting a pollinator uh, friendly garden in your own backyard. Not all bees will live in hives. Sometimes they make their nest in crevices of wood, right? And in order for, or to prevent them from making that in your own house, uh, you can definitely look up the St. John's Beekeeping Association and you can figure out how you can get your very own native bee hotel. So they will nest here as opposed to in your house. Here in a little bit, we actually will be joining, or uh, the Honey Truck Bee Company will be joining us to talk all about pollinators and exactly what makes pollinators tick. We're really excited to have them here join us today, so let's go ahead and go back into our classroom and get started. All right, and we're back here in our Adventure Outpost, and I have Danielle, our very special guest with us today, and she is gonna tell us all about some of our native pollinators and what she does day to day. So Danielle, you are the owner of the Honey Truck Company, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I own the Honey Truck here in St. Augustine, and I'm a local beekeeper. I keep beehives all around St. John's County, and we harvest and sell that honey out of our vintage red Econoline truck. Awesome, I know I personally love uh, locally sourced honey. Can you tell me what you do on a day-to-day -to, -day to supply us this honey? Absolutely. Every day is different uh, when it comes to honeybees. You can open it up and it could be a harvest day or you could open up the bees and realize that you have to start treating for mites or they're too big and you need to get them a bigger box. Uh, so it's every day is different but in order to produce your honey I'm with these bees year-round and that means that I am 
again, treating them for mites or feeding them sugar water during the winter when there's not a lot of resources. Or right now, it's currently April and the bees are starting to bring back a bunch of nectar because everything is blooming, yeah. it's got a lot of resources. And so that's when you see those beehives and those boxes are continually stacked on top of each other. The bees are making honey and I'm getting ready to harvest it. Awesome, yeah, I know we just saw a bunch of our pollinators out back uh, pollinating and going back and forth between the flowers. But I do see you have brought some really cool materials with you today. Yeah. Can you tell me what you've brought with us? Okay, yeah. So this is a, a honeybee house and it consists of several different pieces. So the bottom here is what's called a brood box and that's where all of the baby bees live. The queen lives and she lays her eggs down here. Um, they also have some nectar and pollen in here as well. There are no beehives here now. Um, this is obviously very old, very well-loved equipment. Um, but when I harvest honey, I never harvest from this box. It's like when you go to work, um, this is your home and this is the bees' home. And so when they go to work, this is where they are. And so that's what I'm harvesting from. Um, and just for my bees in general, I'm always leaving them plenty of honey because if they're not healthy, then they're not gonna be able to make me extra honey. So my first priority is them and making sure that they're okay before I take what I want from their hive. Um, but we can go ahead and open it up. Oh, this awesome. is a yeah. flat box. No, we're good. Got it. Like I said, there's no bees here. Uh, this is what's known as a honey super. So I have a 10 frame box and these are honey frames. Um, they don't have any wax on them. This is a plastic foundation that the bees can build their wax out on and they will fill it with nectar and cap it and it makes honey. Um, so when I'm going through, I'm continually looking to make sure that the bees are filling it out, that they don't need more space, or if this box is getting kind of full about 70%, I'll throw another box on so that they're gonna make more honey and not get too crowded. Um, when I'm making sure that the bees are healthy, this box is actually empty, I don't have any frames in here, but they're just bigger frames that look just like that, and they'll have a that's bunch of baby bees and pollen. Um, you can look down in here, that's a screen bottom board, and that just kind of gives them some air. It is very hot here in Florida. Um, bees do poop, there's a bunch of uh, <laughs> trash that kind of gets filtered down, yeah. and so that way it doesn't stay inside the box, it just falls down onto the ground. But that's kind of what I, go through as a beekeeper and there are obviously um, several tools that we use when right. we're inside the hive. Obviously you're not going to wear what you're wearing now. So. No, I'm not. I love bees and I hear after about the first thousand stings it stops hurting <laughs> but I'm not willing to test that theory so I do, yeah, wear, well. <laughs> I do wear a hive suit. Um, again, you can tell this is a very loved, well-used hive suit. It smells not very pleasant. <laughs> Um, but it protects me. It is white because in Florida it's hot. It's, you yeah. know, you're not going to go out there wearing a dark shirt or anything. How easy is it to put on? Um, I mean, it's pretty easy. You just kind of step in, zip it up, and you're all set to Do go. you think I could try it out? You can try it on if this you want. Awesome. I've always wanted to try it on the bee suit. Right, uh, yeah. So when a bee lands on the bee suit, do you feel like if it were to sting, do you feel it at all? Um, sometimes the stings do come through. They're not as sharp as they would if it was just in your skin in general. Okay. Uh, but it's important to note that when honeybees sting you, they're not doing it out of aggression. They're doing it in defense to their hive. Um, a honeybee, when she stings you, will die in doing that because her stinger is barbed and it gets stuck in your skin. So when she goes to fly away, that stinger stays in your skin and it rips out part of her inside, so. So bees don't really want to sting us. No, they don't. That suit might be a little small on it here, It is but... a little small, but I think, <laughs> I think it is. This is so cool. Yeah. And so, I, have, I have gloves that I did not bring, but I wear So you wear gloves. this. Right, right. Every time. Absolutely, and it's important okay. you always zip it completely shut because the last thing you want is a bee in your hat and veil, hence the term bee in your bonnet. Ah, that's Get what I'm Yeah, to I okay. have actually had a bee in my bonnet and <laughs> I freak out every time. I've been stung in the face, it's not pleasant. I feel like if you work with bees, you'll get stung once or twice. You do, you do. Uh, yeah. And most times it's an accident. It's, you know, Great. just kind of a hazard of the job, yeah. so to speak. But yeah, so then when oh. I'm doing a hive inspection, this is my hive tool. It is the number one thing that I use. I'm going to show it to you. It's gross, dirty. I should probably clean it. Uh, but it's got this little pry bar tip here because bees make what's called propolis. 
And it's a sticky resin that they make from tree sap and they use it as a way to um, keep things clean inside their hive. They use it as a glue, it holds okay. things together. If there's a hole or a leak inside their hive, they're gonna fill it with that resin. And so everything gets super sticky and I couldn't just walk up to that box with these right. in it and pull off. I need to pry it off. So I'm using awesome. this, I use it to move frames around. Um, easier this than my fingers doing it. Yeah. And then I also have my smoker here, my trusty smoker. These don't like smoke, right? So they're, they're kind of okay with it. It's not like they hate it, but uh, when I fill the smoker, I typically use hay. You can use pine straw or any sort of thing mm -hmm. that will burn. Um, you don't want it to be super hot. So it's a cool smoke, almost extinguished, and that's what creates that white puff of smoke you see. Um, these, a lot of people assume that it uh, gets bees high. It does not. <laughs> when you go inside a hive, bees immediately emit a pheromone that's an alarm and it says, hey guys, oh my gosh, someone is coming into our hive. We need to be on guard, defend our stuff because I'm going into their home and they're wanting to protect it. And so as a beekeeper, I light this smoker, I get it all cool, and then I just kind of puff, I kind of puff at their entrance and say, hey guys, you know, like, I'm here, and so what that smoke does is it masks that alarm pheromone. So they can't really, you're interfering with their communication, and so it has the effect of calming them down. Uh -huh. If they don't smell the alarm pheromone, they're not gonna be as defensive, and they're a little bit calmer when you work the hive. Awesome. Yeah. So do you have any tips? By the way, this is a very comfortable suit. I would totally wear this one. Um, do you have any tips for anyone that wants to maybe start their own pollinator garden, or you know, how can they attract native pollinators their house. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we, I keep honeybees and it's important to note that honeybees are a social insect. So they live in a big colony. There's about 40 to 60,000 bees in that hive, but native pollinators are often solitary bees. So they live alone. It's just one bee and her babies and uh, they live in pollinator homes, hotels, kind of like this. So you can see that there are these long tubes that they can go in, they lay eggs, and it's just room for one. Um, but if you wanna get started in keeping bees, if you don't wanna keep honeybees, creating one of these pollinator hotels is a great way to get started to help out bees. Um, you can do it, you can see that this is just bamboo that they've put in here. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have a lot of resources, you have a neighbor and you say, hey, they've got bamboo in their yard, you can go and cut it and cut it up into tiny little tubes, take a shoelace and tie it together and put it in a crook of a tree, set it on the ground in your garden, that way you're giving bees a place to go. Um, I know that we're right now in a wooden structure and carpenter bees are notorious for digging holes into wood. So if you give them a place to go, they're gonna be more likely to go here because they don't have to do all of the work of taking out all of the wood. Than in your house. Correct, <laughs> exactly. So that would be a great way to get started to helping bees. Obviously planting native plants uh, mm -hmm. is a big help to them. And I would recommend, if you're interested in honeybees, joining the St. John's County Beekeepers Association. And that's where we got. Absolutely, um, I'm a member helpful. there, and uh, beekeepers are the friendliest people around. So if you need help, they're willing to do that. Um, they're willing to teach you about things. I've allowed other people to come and see my hives if they're like, hey, I'm kind of nervous, I think I can do this, but I want to make sure before I bring stinging insects home. Yeah. It's always a great resource. Awesome. Now, you, of course, are dealing with everything going on, like just like everyone else. So how can people get in touch with you about getting locally sourced honey? Absolutely, you can go to honeytruck.com. You can send us an email there. You can purchase honey there. And if you have beekeeping questions, like I said, just go in. Um, my email address is danielle at honeytruck.com. Feel free to send me an email. I'm always around. Yes. Oh, awesome, well thank you so much for coming in. All right, and thank you guys for joining us for another edition of our virtual backyard field trips. I hope you learned a little bit about pollinators and how you can start your own pollinator garden right in your own backyard. If you are looking for additional activities, you can definitely do a bug or an insect uh, scavenger hunt and you can check off all of the different species that you find. Remember, there's over 125 million, million of them, so you're going to have to have a pretty long list. Now, if you are interested in tuning in again next week, we will be talking all about sea turtles as the sea turtle season starts on May 1st and goes all the way through October 31st. So we will see you next Friday at noon for a conversation about our sea turtles and our beaches. Again, if you're looking for different ways to support, support the alligator farm, tune into our website or go to our social media pages to learn how. 
We'll see you guys next week.